Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our study in the book of James. Now, we're learning a lot from James, a lot of things that we can use in our everyday life. So let's make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we are under the control of the Holy Spirit when we do our study. So let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that we have the freedom to do so. We ask that we will be determined to learn your word so we will follow Jesus better in our lives so that we might go on to spiritual maturity. So we ask now that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin with a quick review of what we saw last time. Now, <clears throat> why do I review things? Well, I want to make sure that we've learned it. And maybe last time we went through it, you could have missed something. So we're going to go over the major points. We're not going to go through all the verses, but I want us to recall what we've learned. Remember, we had an introduction where we learned that all believers have a basic inheritance package. Okay? Also, we learned that there are rewards. Rewards are given to those who do good works. And that comes on top of the inheritance package. And then we saw that on top of rewards, there are some special crowns. The scripture mentions three major crowns that are given. Excuse me, three major rewards given in the form of a crown. Now we saw those crowns as the crown of life. The crown of life was the first one we looked at. Then we looked at the crown of righteousness. That was number two. And then we saw the crown of glory. All right. So let's get this fixed in our mind. We are saved. by grace through faith. We believe what Jesus did for us. We believe in who he was and we are saved. He did the work. When we are saved, it's Christ who did the work and we place our faith on Jesus Christ. So there are no works involved here because Jesus Christ did the work. You see, Jesus is the one that went to the cross. He's the one that died for us. And all we got to do is believe it. And every person can believe if he chooses to believe. Now, once we are saved, we can win, or should I say earn. Oh, let me back up. Once we are saved, we receive a basic inheritance package. We receive eternal life. We receive a resurrection body. We receive a place in heaven. And then from heaven, we move into the millennium and on into the uh, eternity with the new heavens and the new earth. Now, every believer will receive the basic inheritance passage, package because his relationship to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the minimum. 
But Jesus taught, and the scripture teaches, that on top of that, we can receive rewards. And we receive rewards for obedience and service, for good works, for doing things that scripture tells us to do. Jesus spoke about this a lot. But then on top of the rewards, there are crowns. Let's see if we can name them. What's the first one we studied? The crown of life. And that's get given for enduring trials. There's a crown of righteousness. This is given for enduring the good fight. For fighting the good fight. For staying in there in the tough situations. And continuing to obey God. And then there's the crown of glory. And this is what you receive for your service to others. As you grow and you develop your spiritual gifts, you use that towards other people. Sometimes it's towards the unbeliever. Sometimes it's towards God's people, the church. And that's for service that we receive the crown of glory. Now, these rewards... And crowns should all motivate us to want us to make us want to serve Christ. Now, even receiving the basic inheritance package, we know that God has for us eternal life and salvation. Even that should make us realize, even out of thankfulness, that we want to begin to serve him. But remember, to serve him well, we need to what? Grow in what way? Spiritually. All right. Now, we're going to look at the way to win crowns. Not only grow spiritually, but listen to some of the verses. There's a lot here. So let's look at them. Point D in our outline, in our doctrine, is how to win crowns. A is the scripture. I didn't number that properly, but anyway. A is the scripture. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Endure hardship. All right? No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. And what's that telling, it, telling us is that we should not let ourselves get so distracted, so turned away from serving Jesus that we forget what we're here for. A good soldier knows his mission, he knows his equipment, his weapons, and he goes out and completes his mission. He doesn't have time to think about, oh, when I get home, I want to drive my new car around. No. He thinks about the mission. Verse 5. Now, that, that verses 3 and 4 are a comparison. Look at verse 5. Similarly, in other words, like it, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Huh. So, how does an athlete receive the crown of victory? Well, First of all, he has to be devoted to his sport. He has to practice and practice. You know, if you're going to be a long runner and run in a marathon or a long distance race, what are you going to have to spend a lot of time doing? Running, of course. Now, when it says he must uh, compete according to the rules, 
Well, that means that you're going to have to go through the training. And then you're going to have to go through the trials to qualify to see if you're one of the fastest runners to represent your team. And he has to follow the rules. So, this is telling us we need to be devoted as a good soldier, not be distracted, and then follow the rules, which is a way of saying we need to make sure that we do God's will and the way that we win crowns. We can't do it by cheating or breaking the rules or not training or not uh, doing what we're supposed to when we are getting ready to run the race. You have to, for example, this may sound like a silly example, but you can't wear illegal shoes. You can't wear clothes or do things that would make it illegal. All right? So you have to follow the rules. Now, there's another verse or set of verses I want us to look at. In 1 Corinthians 9.24. 1 Corinthians 9.24. This is Paul writing again. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. So Paul is telling us that when we serve God, we are to push ourselves to, to the prize. That is, we work hard at it. We serve Christ faithfully so we can get the prize. Look at verse 25. We talk about training again. Everyone who competes in the games, that would be the, the uh, competitive games in Paul's day where the Romans would, would have competition in their big stadiums. It might be a running game or maybe it was riding horses or throwing the spear or jumping another athletic event. Here it says, verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Well, if you're going to be an athlete, you have to start training. If you need to run, you have to get out and run. If you need to jump, you need to practice your jumping so you'll become a better jumper. Now here it says that they do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now the crown that will not last is the crown that the athlete wins, the runner wins, or the jumper wins. And it was often just a wreath made up of maybe tightly woven uh, leaves but he got to go around and say, I am the best. All right? But you know what? It won't be long before someone breaks his record or someone beats him in a race and he doesn't get the crown. Also, if that crown's made out of leaves, what's going to happen? They're going to wither. And they're going to fall off. It doesn't last for long. It may not last but a few months. His record may be broken the next time they have games. He may be beat in the next race. But for now, you see, he's the best. But the point is, his crown will not last. But look at the crown that the believer can get when he serves faithfully. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Our crown that we receive from Jesus Christ after we die and he returns, that crown will last forever. 
that never ends, right? It goes on and on and on. We hold on to that crown forever. Now, what does that do to you when you think about it? Do you want to spend your life winning some crown here on, on earth? Or do you want to spend your life and win an eternal crown? A crown that lasts forever. You see? So what's Paul say about himself? Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. That's a way of saying I run with a purpose. I have a goal in mind. I do not fight like a man beating the air. I'm just not out there swishing my arms around. I have a purpose. Verse 27. No, I beat my body. That means he disciplines his body and make, makes it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You see, he's talking about the crown. He wins in service. Probably referring here to the crown of glory. It could be any one of them. But he disciplines himself. He stays on course like we saw earlier, like the soldier. He keeps his mind on what he's supposed to do. And here we see that he trains himself to do the right thing. So he won't be disqualified. For the prize. Let's look at the comment. The believer must be willing to endure hardship and suffering. Like a soldier is devoted to his duty, so the believer is singularly, now that's a big, long, hard to say word that means this is the only thing. He is singularly dedicated to his service for Christ. Like an athlete who follows the rules for training, to be qualified, qualification, and the games, so the believer must be, must be trained, qualified, and gifted in the area in which he serves. He must be trained, qualified and gifted in the area in which he serves. Let me get that up there one more time. Like an athlete who must follow the rules for training, qualification, and the games, whatever the games requires, so the believer must be trained, qualified, and gifted in the area in which he serves. Okay, well that tells us how to win crowns, right? We stay devoted, we follow the rules. You know, one of the rules that might be broken, you see this sometime in sports, that they have someone on the team that's too old to be on that team. Or he is not from that area of town which the team represents. And that means they get disqualified. And often the whole team has to give up whatever prize they were going to win. So qualification is very important. You have to be saved. You have to be following Christ. You have to be enduring what God wants you to endure. Now, along that line, let's talk about the loss of crowns. Crowns can be lost. Even at, let me say that again. Even after a person wins the crown, let's say he's 60 years old and he's won one or two of these crowns, he can lose them. He or she can lose them. Now that may be a shock to you, but we have to go along with what the scripture says, no matter what we like, huh? Point three, loss of crowns. The scripture, Revelation 3.11, I am coming soon. This is Jesus speaking. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. 1 Corinthians 
No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Disqualif disqualified. You see? Second John 8. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. So it's possible to earn crowns and then lose them because you decide you're not going to endure or stay with following Jesus as you should. That would be sad, wouldn't it? To work 40 years serving Jesus and then go off in another direction for some weird reason. So Paul warns us, John warns us, John warns us a couple of times. He does the one in Revelation, the one in 2 John. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for. Now, let's look at the time of the rewarding of crowns. One of these verses we already looked at. Finally, this is 2 Timothy 4.8. The crown of righteousness is reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved, remember that means longed, for his appearing. Now, when, is a re when does he receive the reward? On that day. And what is that day? His appearing. Revelation 11.8 the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your, servant, your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both great and small, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. So judgment comes and there is rewarding for servants like the prophets and the saints. That would be us. Revelation twenty two twelve, one of the last verses in Scripture. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward with me is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So, the reward comes when Christ returns at the second advent, to give us what we have earned for our service. You see? Now, let's go back to James, where there is a change of subject in verse 13. Beginning in verse 13, James changes the subject. He's going to talk about temptation. Let's read it, then we'll look at the temptation. James 1.13 reads, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Hmm. Now this may be a little confusing, so let's sort it out. Let's first of all, what does the word tempted mean? I bet you know what that means already. Tempted has to do with someone or something trying to make someone do something. All right? Now, there's a lot of somethings in there. Let me, let me get on the board for you. Tempted has to do with someone or something trying to make someone do something. Usually it's something they shouldn't do. Let me give an illustration. Let's use the verb tempt. All right? Let me make sure I get all of this on the board for you, though. That's important that you see it all. Okay. Here it comes. 
The word tempt used as a verb. Joe tempted Bill, who was on a diet, to eat a big bowl of ice cream. Now let me ask you a question. Who's the tempter? Joe. Who's being tempted? Bill. Bill's being tempted. Next question. What is the temptation? It's something you want, but you shouldn't have, especially on a diet. Right, that's the ice cream. So we see the word tempt, tempted, and temptation all going on in this one sentence. So temptation is something you want, but you should not have. Now, in James, in our passage in verse 13, it's talking about temptation to sin. Now, we know that God doesn't want us to sin. But sometimes we are tempted, tempted to sin. Tempted to sin. And what James says here, at the very start, God does not tempt anyone to sin. So when you're tempted to do something you know you're not supposed to do, that's a sin, God is not doing that. Then James begins to explain why no one should ever think that God is tempting someone to to sin. Here's his explanation. He starts out like this. For God cannot be tempted by evil or evil people. Now, it sounds like God's the one being tempted here. Well, yeah, that's what it says. But what is the connection between God not being tempted and him tempting someone else. All right? Now, let me just show you one little uh, way, another way of looking at this. And I wanted to show you this because it seems like another way to look at it that's helpful. The word for cannot be tempted is actually one word, and it means untemptable. So if we were to go directly more from the Greek to the English, it would say, for God is untemptable of evil things or people. So, if God is untemptable of sin or evil, what's the connection? Well, let me show you. We have to look at something we learned about God a long time ago in our First Thing series. The first thing we want to remember about God is that God, God is holy. Have you ever sang the song, Holy, Holy, Holy? God is three times holy. This means a couple of things. It means, first of all, that God is pure, that he's sinless, that he's without any touch or taint of sin or evil. Now, holiness is a term you see a lot in the Old Testament. That had a lot to do with their ritual. It had a lot to do with their temple and the priest and the way people lived. But listen to what God says about himself in Leviticus 11, 44, and 45. And also what he says about us. Leviticus 11, 44. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves. That means to set yourself aside to do this all right and be holy because I am holy God wants people 
who are with him to be holy, clean, pure. Look at the next line. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. Don't be touching animals that you shouldn't if you're going to go worship God. It's a sign of unholiness. That sounds odd to us, but to the Old Testament saints, those who lived under that covenant, this rule of not touching unclean animals taught them about what holiness was. You see, verse 45, I am the Lord your I am the I am the Lord who bought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I am holy. Now, holiness means two things. God is sinless and pure. Let's write that one down. God is sinless and pure. The second thing it means, set apart. Let me illustrate this one. It means that God is by himself when it comes to being holy. Everything else is common. What I mean by common is that everything else can be unholy or what we call common. It's apart from God. It's at a distance from God. Now, how do we get close to God? We have to, we have to live holy. You see? But what we want to learn here is that God is holy. And since there is no sin or purity, number one, he would never tempt anyone to sin. That would be sinful. If you tempt someone to sin, that's a sin. So God would never do it. And secondly, he can't do it. He doesn't relate to unholiness. There's no path between God and unholiness. You see, God is holy. Down here, it's unholy. And God is separated from it. And you say, well, how can we ever get to God? Ah, the cross. You see, Christ took upon himself our unholiness our sin that made us holy before God. That's why we can spend eternity with Him. So when we die and we shed these old sinful bodies, we arrive in the presence of God holy and pure. So, again, why can why God cannot tempt us to sin is because he's sinless and pure. He can't do it. He won't do it. It's against who he is. Think about that. It's against who he is. And he's also set apart. He doesn't come into contact with unholiness. There's a lot of principles of scripture related to this. I can give you some of them here up on the board. Or we can just look at them quickly. Referring to God's holiness. He is called the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 71, 22. His way is holy. Psalm 77, 13. His name is holy. Psalm 97, 12, 103, 1, 105, 3. There's a lot of scriptures on that. His dwelling is holy. Psalm 68, 5. Now, we're going to go a little long here, but let's get the second reason in that God cannot tempt to sin. And that is because God is also righteous. Now there's a simple explanation of righteousness. 
God always does the right thing. He's always perfectly right and just and fair. Everything God does is perfectly right and just and fair. So since God is righteous, now listen to this. Since God is righteous, everything he does is righteous. That's right. Righteous. Everything God does is righteous. Lots of scriptures on that. Um, let me just give you a few. Nehemiah 9.6, Job 4.17, Psalm 4.1, and 7.9. Let me get one up here for you. Psalm 11.7. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, upright men will see his face. You see, upright men are those who are righteous, those who are saved. A couple of more points here. His decisions, his laws, his judgments are righteous. Psalm 19.9 he will judge the world in righteousness. When God judges, it will be perfectly fair. Acts 17.31 Okay? So, with this in mind, that God is holy, that He is righteous, He Himself tempts no one to sin. God in no way possible will tempt anyone to disobey his clear commands, his rules for how we are to live. He will never tempt anyone to disobey him. Hmm. Well, that brings up our next verse, verse 14, and that's where we'll begin next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge it's given us. We thank you that you have not only challenged us, but have given us things to learn, to believe, and apply. And let us know out there that when we are tempted to sin, that you're not doing it, but it's from another source. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We ask now that we'll help recall these things, remember these things when we should. In Jesus' name, amen.